Thank you, uh, thank you so much, and uh, it's absolutely fantastic to, to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my thanks to the organisers for two excellent days of contributions and, and also for asking me to make the final contribution today to you, the TVET community. I'm really delighted and, and honoured to be here to address you today, and I can honestly say that the, the efforts of travelling to San Sebastian and catching a cold on the flight has all been worth it. So I apologize for my, uh, my voice in advance. My contribution today is titled Equity and Inclusion, the Universal Foundation upon which TVET is built. And it's a, it's a really big title and I'm very conscious that I'm now standing in front of you as a speaker, but not just standing in front of you as a speaker, also standing between you and a rather good conference dinner. I'm also following a group of young people talking about migration, climate change, equity and inclusion, and in fact changing the world. So I, I think I've got a real fight on now to make a really good speech, but uh, well done to all of you for making that contribution. I don't think I could have stood on this stage in the way that you did and make that when I was your age, so well done. My contribution today is going to have um, uh, three elements really. Um, and, and um, I've got three things I want to share with you, and then I've got a really big ask at the end that I'd all like you to play a part in. The, the three things I want to cover in my contribution will be the experience of the English TVET ecosystem and just share that with you. The current economic landscape in the UK and, and its impact on poverty, and particularly child poverty. And then the major part of my contribution is going to be a reflection on the systemic equity and inclusion challenges in England and the fundamental role of TVET in addressing them. It's been really heartening to, to listen to the last contributions by our colleagues because the themes that were coming out from the workshop sessions align really well with my contribution today. So, so let me make a start now and then I'll try and bring it all together. And in making that start, I just want to put on record how much I resonated personally with the contribution of Denise Amyot at yesterday's session on equity and inclusion. So it's not my intention to repeat her key points, but to try and build on them in my contribution from a very personal perspective and to share with you um, the experience in the United Kingdom and the opportunities for global TVET as I see them. I also very much want to associate myself with remarks made yesterday on the impact of the pandemic, on exposing inequalities in our countries, on EDI, and on the impact on, on mental health. We can never do enough to address the barriers to equity, diversity, and inclusion. I also, as I said earlier on, want to acknowledge the brilliant session on the voice of youth today. I've, I've no doubt that every one of us in this room, without exception, is an advocate for young people. And as professionals and practitioners, listening to the voices of young people, ensuring their active involvement and participation in the things that matter to them is at the heart of everything we do in TVET. And the youth that were here today are a great example of that voice. And I really do congratulate you on your contribution. In, ter in terms of my personal history in education and training, I, I've been the chair of the board of a high school and a primary school in the UK, and I've been supporting further education sector and colleges specifically for over 20 years of my life through roles on a number of college boards, developing, reviewing and revising strategy and holding management to account for its implementation and its delivery. And more recently, I've done that as the chair of the board of the Luminate Education Group, which is a £125 million organisation, which has a family of schools, colleges, and higher education institutions based in the north of England. And I've been the chair of that group for the past eight years. I'm also really privileged to be the chair of the magnificent organisation that's known as the National Association of Colleges. And and David, is, uh, is, uh, David Hughes is their chief executive. And it's England's voice for further education, for sixth form colleges and for tertiary and specialist colleges. And it's a not-for-profit organisation. And under David's leadership, it's worked really diligently on behalf of its many member organisations to increase its influence on government, and on policymakers to deliver real tangible resources for learners and positive policy changes to ensure that the impact of further education as a sector 
is not just understood, but that it's recognised. And I think David would say that is a daily challenge. Some of the brilliant team at the Association of Colleges is in the audience today and has been here for the last couple of days. And I personally want to thank them on behalf of the board of the Association of Colleges for everything they've done during the pandemic and ensuring that the voice of further education remained impactful and influential through the last couple of years. More recently, after a career in local government, I was appointed as the Pro Vice Chancellor for Durham University, the first person of colour to join the executive team in nearly 200 years of its history. I hope I'm not the last. I've got a brief around organisational equity, diversity and inclusion, driving people and culture change, and I'm supporting the work of a very elite university to widen access and participation for those from minority communities, including those from more disadvantaged backgrounds, irrespective of their country or community of origin. So essentially, I feel I can look across the educational and training ecosystem in England with a high degree of appreciation, understanding, and perhaps some foresight as well. And my contribution today is gonna to be flavored by that experience in England, because that is what I know. And having heard the contributions to the sessions yesterday, it does feel like it will have resonance with some of your experiences in other countries too. So my personal driver for my engagement in this sort of work and the work that I've done on a voluntary basis for over 20 years is my passion for, for social justice and the role of education and specifically technical and vocational education and training in driving social mobility upwards, helping individuals to achieve their potential and to positively impact on the lives of our families and of their communities. So let's just have a look at the economic and societal backdrop of TVET in the United Kingdom. So historically, the United Kingdom, its labor productivity has grown around 2% every year. But since the financial crash and the 2008-2009 recession, productivity has stagnated. In 2019, the United Kingdom was fourth in the G7 ranked on GDP per hour worked and was around 15% below the United States, France and Germany. So it really does seem that our friends in Germany and France can finish work on a Thursday afternoon and enjoy a coffee and cheesecake on the beach here in San Sebastian, whilst us in the UK are still working until Friday afternoon. But all joking aside, that is a really big gap for the United Kingdom and one that we must find a way of recovering. It's estimated that Brexit alone will have around a 4% impact on GDP, larger than the impact of the, of the pandemic. And it will contribute more to the acute cost of living crisis that we're experiencing in the United Kingdom, with the UK economy arguably recovering from the shock of the pandemic much more slowly than its peers. According to the Office of National Statistics, the United Kingdom is already £2.4 trillion in debt, and that is growing, with a cost of living crisis likely to add to that figure. So £2.4 trillion is 96.2% of the United Kingdom's GDP, and that's at levels that haven't been seen since the 1960s, and a debt which will fall on future generations, including my own children. And in terms of child poverty, 3.9 million children, so that's 27% of all children, are now in poverty. So if you can imagine a class of 30 children, eight of those will be living in poverty. And the country has food banks in nearly every city and every town in the country. And for the sixth largest economy in the world, that should be a source of national shame. 49% of children living in, are living in lone parent families in poverty. And children from minority ethnic groups are more likely to be in poverty compared to white British families. And the United Kingdom has modified over the last decade its benefit system through universal credit, trying to get to a place where it can make work pay. So actually reducing benefits so people go to work to fill the gap. But the reality is that today, work does not provide 
a guaranteed route out of poverty in the United Kingdom anymore. 75% of those children I'm talking about are growing up in poverty, they, but they live in a household where at least one person actually works. So it's really clear that in order to develop and grow, any individual needs to have a level three qualification, so A levels and above, to stand any chance to earn anything other than the minimum wage in the United Kingdom. So the data on the impacts of the pandemic in the UK is still yet to be fully realized. My own experience on the ground, having worked for local government, suggests strongly that underlying poverty and inequality, which existed before the pandemic, has deepened and it's broadened in the UK's most disadvantaged communities, and that poverty does not respect the color of your skin. And increasing inflation is pushing already very stretched household budgets deeper into poverty. So let's just think about work and learning and how that's changed. Well, a recent statistic showed that some 600,000 people in the UK over the age of 50 who can afford to do so have already decided to leave the workplace or have left the workplace, recognizing that actually life is really short. And the pandemic brought that home to us really effectively. And those who are younger and in employment are now asking, how are you as an employer helping me to have a better work-life balance? And tensions between employers and employees are beginning to emerge with home working and hybrid working being seen as increasingly fundamental to work-life balance. So there was a great session chaired by Mary Farroni yesterday on views of the world, where Mary and the, tip, the panel reflected on how much the experience of the world in the past two years under the pandemic has disturbed the infrastructure and the key reliables that TVET organizations operated alongside. And there were really positive and optimistic views expressed on how TVET could shape, shift, and innovate to contribute to be more relevant to students and really promote entrepreneurship. And that's certainly true in the UK as well. However, in the UK, we, we, we have long-standing systemic issues in education, in culture, in class, and in race. And these influence and shape our experiences, and they limit our opportunities with negative impacts on the outcomes of younger people. So people from black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds perform less well than their peers. Not just that, but white males from poor, working class communities in the country perform less well and drop out earlier from education, from training and employment. And that causes issues around extremism. Whilst there appears to be a very active denial by government of institutional racism in the organizations in the country. Prominent cases, and I'm not sure if everybody follows this, but there was a, an organization called Yorkshire County Cricket Club, and that's been very uh, prominent in the news because of the mistreatment of an Asian sportsman. There's also been huge headlines around the targeted strip searching of young black females by police officers in London. And these continue to make the headlines. So on the one hand, there's a denial of institutional racism, but our lived experience suggests something very, very different. And it's important that I share that with you. It's also important to realize that more than half of the people in the UK will not go to a university, certainly not Durham University, and the British economy needs technical and vocational education and training if it's serious about tackling the impact of Brexit, the recovery from the pandemic, and the cost of living crisis. The economy has to grow, and productivity has to improve. So without doubt, this is a huge opportunity for England to drive forward technical and vocational education and training. And yet, as I said earlier on, the sector that delivers it doesn't always make the positive headlines in the way that universities and the schools do. And that has to change. And oh, David and his colleagues are working very hard to make sure that happens. 
We all need to work together to ensure that we've got strong, robust strategies of mutual support to maximise our visibility with our governments. So the context of this discussion is around equity and inclusion. And, and, and I, so the question is, why is equity and inclusion important in the context of TVEP? And in answering that question, I, I'm conscious that equity and inclusion can mean different things to different people and approaches to equity and inclusion differ from one country to another. What, what I can say to you, though, is that at the macroeconomic level, the UK economy just cannot afford to have a narrow focus on building the country, deploying the assets and resources and talents of just some parts of its society and not focus on others, not deploy assets and, and resources in other communities. Employers in England, as David was saying earlier on and has said this morning, are really struggling to find skilled workers today. So the success for the United Kingdom economy over the next eight years to two, 2030 is, in my view, highly dependent on developing a more inclusive approach that reaches, engages, and encourages all parts of society and all communities, irrespective of their background. And this is where organizations that deliver TVET can be incredibly impactful. We can help to promote equity and inclusion. We can help to develop the competencies that that approach requires. But we can also help employer organizations with developing their culture, the culture that they need to attract and retain skilled workers from those diverse, more different backgrounds and help them truly feel, as a colleague was saying earlier on, to feel like they really belong in that employer's organization. Being relentlessly focused on equity and inclusion helps TVET institutions deliver improved outcomes for their students. It supports strategies to widen access and participation and helps students to feel like they truly belong and that they have a stake in their communities and in their country as a whole, no matter their community or their country of origin. And frankly, Let's be honest, it makes really good business sense. It's fundamental to how people should be treated and it helps deliver real organizational level culture change. But importantly, TVET doesn't actually just empower individuals. It empowers their families and it empowers their communities. Of course, equity, diversity and inclusion alone cannot guarantee superior performance. And I say this a lot in the discussions that I have with leaders um, in the UK. L leadership is key, but you need leadership that can truly harness the talents of those different and disparate individuals that come from different backgrounds, really molding them into a team that provides high challenge and high support. And not just focused on there's a problem to solve, so let's bring people together to try and solve those problems. This is about truly working together to improve outcomes for students, for their families and their communities. And we know education has both a social and an economic purpose, and it's based on values. Many of us who operate in this space do it because it plays and speaks to our values about the kind of people that we are and the difference that we want to make to the lives of those students. And so the job of educators isn't just to help a student complete a course successfully, but also help them to go on to be a great human being that flourishes in their chosen occupation and in their lives. Making our institutions more inclusive helps us to do that job even better for our students. So let me share with you a story, and I'm just going to take a quick drink, if that's all right. So let me share with, this, with you a story. It's, a, it's about a 17-year-old boy in England, and his, his two older siblings, his brother and sister, attended the same high school, and they had passed their A-levels with excellent grades. And they'd gone on to university to receive really good degrees in science and in medicine. The boy I'm talking about really struggled at school and he only just passed his GCSEs, that's like level two in the United Kingdom. But he made the mistake of staying on at school at 16 to study A-levels at level three. 
his results really began to slip and he was downgraded in his qualifications to lesser academic courses. His self-esteem and his confidence decreased to the point where getting up in the morning and washing himself was difficult. His relationships with his brother and sister and his peer group of friends deteriorated. And his parents were being called in regularly to the school because his behavior had deteriorated so much. He actually said that he felt worthless. Following advice, he dropped out of school, but started an apprenticeship at the local college in IT. He began to enjoy the course and his relationship with his tutor, who treated him like a young adult and not a little boy, grew. His contribution to his employer's work was well recognised and they financially supported him to complete additional qualifications over, above, over and above his apprenticeship. And he began to grow and develop and thrive. Two years later, he passed his apprenticeship with excellent marks and he received a great reference. He's now 20 years of age and he's engaged in a higher level apprenticeship in cyber security with the National Health Service in the UK. His self-esteem and his confidence has returned. He started to look after his health with weight training and running and playing other sports. And he received help with his mental well-being. And he met a wonderful young woman and now has a girlfriend as well. His world looks very different now, very positive. And he's a proud of his achievements and feels like he can equal his brother and sister. So why am I sharing that story with you? Well, we were asked yesterday by one of the presenters, what advice are we as parents in this conference providing for our children? Well, well that boy that I've been talking about is my son. <clears throat> I'll make sure he knows you applauded him when I go home. <laughs> But the advice that he received from me was to, to, to think about going to a place that helped him with his self-esteem and confidence and that really cared about him and not the grades that he was getting. He left school and attended college and with the help of the local college and staff, he turned his life around. But in all honesty, and thank you for your applause, my concern is as much about those, the parents of those young people who come from less advantaged backgrounds, who don't know the system, those parents who don't know how to navigate information, advice and guidance to help their children to make decisions for their lives and their future. It's not my decision, it's my son's decision. My role is to help him to understand that information, to guide him and to advise him, but for him to be able to be positioned to make that decision for himself. And we need to in the UK, and I'm sure this is true of other places as well, we need to do much more to provide effective, impartial, quality careers education, advice and guidance in a way that's understandable for young people. I would, I would say though, in the United Kingdom, further education organisations have taken very solid steps on equality, equity, diversity and inclusion. And in the past, it was okay to say that, yes, of course, staff in a further education college should reflect the diversity of the communities and workplaces that they serve. But now what we're seeing is a very positive personal action on the part of leaders in those organizations and a real honesty about the challenges with the desire to work together to collaborate on solutions. And these are really uncomfortable conversations because they rely on leaders exposing their vulnerabilities and listening to lived experiences of their students and their staff. Equity allows us to build on our strengths and increasingly colleges are becoming important organisations in their local community, as David was saying earlier on, anchor organisations. The role of leaders in those anchor organisations is one of systems leadership. That's a role that plays across the internal organisational boundaries, but also one that reaches out beyond the organisation 
to organisations like local government, businesses, local police force and health providers and many others. Building bridges, resolving conflicts and overcoming issues of competition with other TVET providers, working with local stakeholders and partners and importantly working alongside and with their communities, not doing things to those communities. And a great example of international cooperation with communities in this space was provided, provided by Roger Ramsamy yesterday when he referred to his work with 10 young women from Ghana providing training for harnessing solar energy and perpetuating a train-the-train -train approach. And the Association of Colleges with David is doing great work in this area, working with leaders in England to create the space for equity, diversity and inclusion conversations. And, and we have at the Association of Colleges heard firsthand the nervousness of time-served leaders, experienced leaders, nervous, because they're concerned about their strategies on equity and inclusion being wrong. And they lack sometimes confidence to drive forward on the agenda. And we need to help them and support them to become more confident and more sure for it. At the same time, we're seeing a new breed of leaders coming through with greater levels of confidence, comfortable with difference and with being different and applying more innovative approaches to equity and inclusion and willing to try different things to try and achieve it, knowing that it might not work, that they might fail, but they'll go again. And that work alongside other sector organisations now is stretching into continuous personal development for staff and for managers and also to board members like myself, because there's a recognition of the important role, leadership role of governors and boards to provide good governance and drive and motivate management to diversify its staff base and also to diversify the board membership and enable the growth of more inclusive organisations. So whilst I appreciate I started this contribution with some very, very difficult headlines in terms of the United Kingdom, and England in particular, I'm genuinely really optimistic about the role of TVET in helping to level up different parts of the country and its contribution to building back from the pandemic and overcoming in time the cost of living crisis. Partly I feel that confident because I just don't see what choice we have except to be more inclusive and promote equity. But also because I have real faith in a TVEC sector that has historically and continues to be totally dedicated to straining every sinew to provide the best possible learning and education environment for our students to succeed personally and professionally. The famous, <clears throat> perhaps controversial, human rights activist Malcolm X said that education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. If Malcolm X is right, then this conference has discussed the most important themes, including the future of work and its implications for TVET, creating opportunities, equity and inclusion, migration, sustainability, and the voices of young people. This is absolutely the right territory, and it's reflective of an important moment in time after the pandemic where we cannot afford as TVET sector providers to stand still. So it's really fantastic that we're all come together here in San Sebastian to discuss important matters in respect of TVET. And I said that there was going to be an ask of you in the room today. So, so, so that ask is in the form of a series of questions. Don't get worried, it's all right. My question for all of you in the room today is, what will you have changed by the time we next come together? You are all leaders, all of you are all leaders, because leadership isn't about your position in an organization and a hierarchy. Real leaders influence and shape organizational change and take personal responsibility to make that happen wherever they are in an organization. So as leaders, I propose for all of us at this conference a genuine call to action 
as you eat your conference dinner and you embark on your homeward journeys? What personal pledges will you make here today that you will take back to your organisations in your countries to help to deliver positive change on equity and inclusion? Who will you engage with locally and internationally following this event to share, to learn, to develop and to implement? And how will you make equity and inclusion centre stage in your organisation and establish a new imperative for making the TVET that you deliver much more inclusive in your places? Well, all of that starts with holding rich, constructive and sometimes really hard to hear conversations that are backed up by a very progressive agenda and an action plan which then leads to educational eco ecosystems in your countries that truly support all individuals, irrespective of their background, who are then well placed to engage with others in, let's be honest, is an increasingly diverse and complex world. So TVET's time really has come and we should be embracing transformation and promoting global collaboration on TVET and embedding approaches to, approaches to equity and inclusion in our institutions and working together to support and challenge each other to address and overcome systemic organisational and non-organisational barriers to progress for all of our staff and our students. And I'm really, really genuinely excited by the road ahead. And I really wish you every success in your endeavors wherever you are. It's been a real pleasure meeting many of you over the last couple of days. Thank you so much for listening to my contribution today. I hope you've had a fabulous couple of days. Have a really safe journey back. Thank you.